A few blogs ago, we discussed the four horsemen in recovery. Uh, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. And it really came over well, but I had a ton of questions from people on, well, what does that look like, and how do we deal with it in infidelity? And I know a number of you are reading the Gottman book, and you're going through it and talking about it. So I want to talk about all four horsemen in the next four blogs and really address it. I'll share some stories from Samantha and I's journey and do my best to kind of help you understand how to manage the horsemen and really keep yourself from being trampled by them. Today, I want to talk about stonewalling. Now, for us, Samantha and I went down the journey of stonewalling what felt like every single day. Samantha is a master stonewaller. Uh, when, we would get in, when we would get into the heat of the battle, she would just shut down. And now me, I'm a trained kind of debater. I, I took debate in college. I used to love to argue. I would, when I would travel and speak, I'd get into arguments sometimes. I got into arguments on planes, all kinds of stuff. So for me, I come from an old school Italian family, so fighting is a form of communication. To Samantha and her family, they didn't fight, they didn't talk, they just stuffed it down. And so we would start to get into this, you know, Gottman calls it a harsh startup. We would start to have that moment where, you know, the blood pressure would rise and you'd start to have a disagreement and she would just shut down and I would get furious. I hated it. I would push even harder, and I did a whole lot more damage by pushing than I did by pulling back and giving her her space. Stonewalling is turtling up. It is where you just run for cover, and in, it, it doesn't just convey, I want to be safe, but it also conveys, hey, I'm going to make you hurt because now I'm not going to give you an outlet for all that crap that's going on inside of you. You get to live with it and you get to sit and stir. So here's a few times, if you will, that we stonewall. Number one, when someone floods, they typically stonewall. There's just a point, especially for the betrayed spouse, and, but it's, it, it's becoming more and more apparent that unfaithful spouses will turtle up when we flood. Our heart rate gets over 100 beats per minute. Our emotions get out of control. We're just not sure what to do, so we turtle up. And it's kind of a mode of protection in that moment because, let's face it, you don't want to throw things or you don't want to throw any more things. You don't want to hurt anybody or hurt yourself. You don't want to do any more damage, and so you turtle up out of almost incapacity. We also like to stonewall when we want to keep the peace at all costs. And I mean that in a negative way. Sometimes we just don't want to talk about it. You know, we just hit that point where we don't want to get into this again, so we just stonewall. We just go, man, I would rather keep the peace than talk about it. And I got to tell you, I used to do that all the time because I was afraid of Samantha's wrath, so I would just rather not talk about it. And it proved to be the worst thing that I could do besides aggressively trying to make her talk because it allows very critical serious issues to lie dormant and not get addressed. And so if you're going to stonewall and stuff it down, it's going to create a whole lot more pain for both of you. We also like to stonewall, and I alluded to this earlier, when we want to what I call make someone pay. We like to stonewall and say, yeah, Sure. Samantha did this so often. Oh, she would just go, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I don't pay enough attention to you. Yeah, you're right. Why well, talk with you? Yeah, I know. Ooh, <laughs> it, it hurt like hell. I hated it. And we do that sometimes to make our partner hurt, to retaliate to bring vengeance, to make them suffer, and it just never works. Most importantly, for in my case, and it might be this way for you, when a spouse feels unsafe, 
they will stonewall. If they just feel like, you know what, if I talk, I get in trouble. If I don't talk, I get in trouble. If I try and communicate what's going on, it doesn't work. So you know what, I just don't feel safe. And that could be for the unfaithful or it could be for the betrayed. In our case, it was for the betrayed because Samantha finally had this breakthrough. And she told me, you know what, I shut down because I don't feel safe. I know that you're a master communicator. You can run circles around me in your communication and you can uh, intimidate and you can turn any argument. I mean, I just would, I had that skill back then and I can kind of use it now if I want to be a jerk. Um, that's what recovery is, understanding the jerkness that lies within us. But she felt unsafe and when she felt unsafe, she shut down. And Rick had to help me understand, you know what? do you want to cause any more pain? And I would immediately say no. He would say, do you want to hurt Samantha more than you've already hurt her? Of course not. Well, then don't try and make her talk when she's not ready or if she's not feeling safe. Another thing I learned is that frustration drives stonewalling. If you're frustrated at the fact that your spouse can't hear you, you'll stonewall. If you're frustrated at the fact that nothing you say is right, you'll stonewall. If you are feeling as though you just can't do anything right, and if you want to be a jerk, you'll just shut down and stonewall. But I got to tell you, it's toxic. So here's some ways to remedy stonewalling. Number one is you've got to find a safe environment, or if you are dealing with the stonewaller, you have to work hard, and especially if you're a betrayed spouse, to create a safe environment. And the way that you create a safe environment is, number one, you find expert help. Number two, you learn how to take a timeout. And we even have something here at the site called a timeout protocol. And if you want that, email the site. I'll make sure that you get it personally. But it really helps you understand why to take a timeout, how to take a timeout. Samantha would do this. In our environment, in our situation, I'll end with this. This is what she would do, or this is what I would do. If she felt unsafe, if she felt like I was, you know, going for the jugular, and if I was going to push on her to talk, she would throw her hands up and say, that's it, I can't do it anymore. I knew at that point, if I keep going, that was her sign that I was gonna hurt her more, I was gonna do more damage, and I was gonna have to own more uh, and take more responsibility for more hurt in Rick's office. And I had a, a sense about me that said, crap, I don't wanna do that. So when she threw her hands up, I had to literally go do some self-soothing. I had to go walk away, go take a walk, go break something in the garage, go throw something outside in the backyard so that the kids couldn't see. I had to do something or else I was going to do more damage. If you're a stonewaller, you've got to communicate to your spouse when there's peace what you need to feel safe. You have to be able to express your frustration and one of the best ways to do that is to find a third party who's an expert, who's been trained on how to deal with infidelity to help you both heal. Because if you can find safety, then the stonewaller won't be so uh, motivated to stonewall, and those that are being stonewalled won't feel so frustrated and angry. So find safety. Find that expert third party. Look at the EMS weekend. It's a great way to remedy stonewall.